Oberman. Um, great speaking here at DEF CONF again, one of the best conferences ever. Uh, my name is Itamar Holder and uh, I'm a Qubit maintainer and a Kubernetes developer. And this talk is about um, what the swap, so swap in Kubernetes, uh, current status and future plans. And when I first wrote this, I just thought to myself, let's try it out and see what happens. So I took a note with swap enable, started Qubit, and the whole thing just exploded immediately, bursting into flames. Um, and I was pretty surprised by that, because, I mean, what the swap is so difficult about it? Can we just um, schedule a pod onto a node with swap enable and let it swap if it has to? Um, so, but first let's talk about a few use cases or why swap is even important. Because there is a common misconception that swap is a thing of the past and it doesn't matter nowadays. Um, there is a very interesting um, piece by Chris Don that's, um, that's called the Indefense of Swap and there it basically says, swap is a hotly contested topic, many see it as useless, a relic of a time where memory was um, scarce and this was were a necessary evil to provide space for swapping. So, yeah, a lot of people feel that way about swap. Um, another quote from the kernel documentation is that you might think that swap is unnecessary, but a significant number of pages may only be used for initialization and then never used again. And this uh, actually happens in a lot of cases. So, for example, language runtimes that um, that uh, uh, load all the source code into memory and then never touches it again or uh, processes that reserve memory in advance for things like custom online handling and things like that uh, or maybe even like shared libraries um, it's common to import a library, use a function just somewhere for initialization and then never touch it again so yeah that's pretty common um, but at least in, in these kind of cases it's still pretty easy to, um, to understand what, what's the amount of memory that's, um, that's used only for initialization. Um, and so let's talk generally about monitoring and profiling um, the memory consumption of pods on Kubernetes. So let's take this graph as an example. Um, like so, in order to understand uh, which limits and requests uh, of memory we should, um, uh, we should set to the pod. Um, we let it run, use tools like Prometheus or something like that to profile and monitor it. And as you can see, at least in this graph, there is some kind of a baseline level of memory and the request will be set somewhere around here, maybe a bit above if we want to be more conservative about it. Um, and then there are memory spikes once in a while and the, the limit will be set like approximately at the highest spike. Again, maybe a bit higher if we want to be more conservative. Um, but this case is pretty easy, so we're going to compli complicate stuff um, a bit. So, first of all, a question to the crowd. So what happens when memory limits are met or when pod reaches the memory limit? Somebody brave from the crowd. Umkill, okay, thank you for this answer because that's the non-accurate answer. Um, but that's a, a common belief, so I don't blame you. Um, what the, the accurate answer is that before the pod dies, the kernel will um, put the pod under a heavy reclaim pressure and will do anything it can to actually free the memory um, to, for the memory to go below the limits. So um, usually what the kernel um, does is freeze um, file, files, open files that could be flushed back to disk caches, kernel structures, and stuff like that. But the reality is that usually it's not a huge amount of memory that could be reclaimed. So you're practically right. I mean, if you reach the limit, um, you usually get, uh, would get unkilled right away. But with swap, it's different. Because with swap, we can actually reclaim gigs of memory, which is a game changer. In, and it's um, really crucial to save, um, to, to, to save the, the pod from crashing, basically. So um, let's speak an, about another case. So on the container level, we could have a graph that looks something like that. So the consumption of memory is predictable, it's constant, nothing happens. And then there is a temporary, rare, and unpredictable memory spikes once in a while. Um, when this happens, like how do you set limits? That, that's problematic because you, you can set limits like way higher than what your, your program will usually um, uh, consume. 
but um, actually, if we if we set limits this way, then um, when, once we reach the limit, then um, uh, the, the, the kernel could um, reclaim memory and basically save it from crashing. And that's um, a thing that's pretty common uh, in many cases. So for example, in machine learning, another um, example is the fork exact pattern, pattern which is used, um, for example, by interpreters like Ruby on Rails. So between the fork, fork and exact, you would double your memory temporarily just for a second. And so that's, uh, that's one of the, of the use cases. Um, we can also look at it at the node level. So let's say that we have a cluster and our nodes are relatively uh, small. We have like uh, 30 gig um, uh, RAM capacity. And let's say that we have to schedule a cron job once in a while, let's say once a week, um, that we do something and we know it consumes about 20 gigs of memory. Um, so without swap, basically um, we can't assume that we have 20 gigs free on, on a node. What will probably happen is that it will get scheduled, some pods will, be, will die, reschedule to somewhere else, and that's just um, a wasted cost that is unnecessary. Um, again, with swap, a few gigs could be swapped away. Um, we would, again, schedule to, it to the most quiet hours, so it's safe to assume that nothing else needs to, to happen here. Um, I, I bet some of you are asking yourself, well, why, why shouldn't we scale in, in, in those situations? And it's not always possible. So, for example, for cost reasons, um, and like in, in uh, on-prem bare metal environments, it also might be not even possible to dynamically add nodes to the cluster. Another um, use case is fast storage, like NVMe. Um, so this is especially important for um, uh, computing on, on the edge. Um, then you have a, a relatively, again, um, uh, small server, and um, if you have NVMe, it could add um, uh, very fast memory that would be added to, to the edge, uh, which is very important in these cases. Um, and by the way, some servers even today have NVMe storage, and this could just be utilized to add um, practically more RAM to the system. Um, another example is very, very small servers. So I'm talking about less than four gigs of memory. If, if that's what you use, then um, Kubelet will start being unstable. But again, a lot of things are used only for initialization and could be swapped away um, afterwards so that uh, this way you can make use of very, very small servers. And another one is third-party applications. So, uh, for example, UMD, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's a user space daemon uh, that's created by Facebook uh, that basically proactively tries to prevent the kernel's UMD killer um, um, to, to be invoked. Um, and this is a very good technology that cannot currently be used with Kubernetes because UMD requires uh, swap to operate correctly. Um, so yeah, as you can see, there are tons of use cases. Uh, but what interested me specifically um, coming to this is Kubert, right? So as I said, um, I'm a Kubert maintainer, and what Kubert basically does is allows you to uh, run virtual machines on Kubernetes as a first-class citizen. And I'm not going to talk about its whole architecture now, but the main trick that you need to understand is that um, the guest runs inside a container. That's basically the trick. Um, but realistically, it, it looks something like that. So in the container, we have the guest itself and another virtualization uh, infrastructure, that, uh, like the hypervisors and, and some other stuff that we need in order for the um, guest to, to operate and run. But if, we, or if we're looking on a node level, it looks a bit something like this. And as you can, because we have many VM instances running there, and as you can see, a lot of the data is duplicated here. So um, first of all, the virt, the virt infra, um, again, I, I think that a lot of the pages that are used for initialization never used again. Um, so that's uh, what we talked about before. Um, but the guest OS is also a thing because um, unlike containers which have a really thin dependency layer, um, virtual machines have a huge dependency layer which is all of the operating system including all of its pages, all of the memory, uh, which is usually not used, but, or, or at least 
not the entirety of it is being used. Um, and we thought about how to solve this issue. Um, and we thought about swap, of course. Another uh, mechanism is called KSM, which stands for kernel same page merging. And the idea is basically if there is a page that is duplicated across the system, it hasn't been recently used, it's going to be merged, um, going to be set as read only and treated as a copy and write matter. Um, so the dangerous part about KSM is that if a page is being duplicated and then at the same time many instances would write to this page, it would be needed to duplicate again. And in this uh, scenario we would have a huge memory spike um, that's sudden and swap act as another safety net to help us from uh, crashing everything. Um, so how do we set memory requests? Um, basically there is the guest memory and the infrastructure overhead. Um, and the memory request equals to the sum of those. What we can do is reduce a bit the memory request, and we call that overcommitment. That basically allows us to increase the density of virtual machines on a node, and we basically assume that some of the pages would be reclaimed, either merged or swapped away. Um, so the both mechanisms work really great together. Um, so in this example, let's say that the, the orange um, pages here are duplicated and nobody touches them. They will be merged into a single page. Um, once um, VMs start writing to it, it will be um, uh, duplicated again. And then the, uh, the, the pages that haven't been used in a while will be swapped away. So these two work really good together. Um, and so as you can see, we have tons of use cases here that are relevant not only to Kubrick. And I, I spoke to my managers about it, and I said that we, I think that we should implement it in upstream Kubernetes. And my manager reacted something like that. <laughs> um, so the, the reason is that um, overcommitment support is very, very important for Red Hat virtualization, and in Kubernetes, features are moving slowly. Uh, there are a lot of eyes looking at every change you do. People are coming to it from many different companies, and it's very, very hard to gain, to gain a broad consensus basically on everything. Um, so yeah, I said let's do it anyways, and let's return to, to this point. What the swap is so difficult about it? Um, so let's get back to the alpha days. That's how it looked like uh, mostly. Um, so it was rotten, abandoned. The developer that started it uh, left the community years ago. There was no interest around it. It has no priority. Nobody was working about, on it. And basically it didn't work, right? It didn't support V2. It, it, yeah, it had tons of problems and nothing really worked. Um, so I started looking into, the, looking into it and um, I've realized really early on that um, one of the most important things about swap is how to limit swap access. Because the thing is that sw swap is a system property and swap abuse could lead to uh, node level instability. And that's um, very scary and, um, and, and the, we need a good way to limit swap access to code. So um, initially, uh, at these alpha days, uh, the cap suggestion was to simply add it to the pod API. So um, just like you request memory, you would be able to request um, swap space. But this is a very bad idea for uh, multiple reasons. So first of all, assigning memory is hard. Assigning swap is almost impossible. It's a system level resource, as I said. So um, a, a pod can swap pages away because of external reasons that are not related to what the pod is doing by any means. Um, another thing is, so, so if that's the case, how, how is it even possible to profile it? How does it even possible to yeah, to reason about it. Another thing is that uh, swap is machine dependent. Um, the ratio between the swap size and the RAM size is different between every machine. Um, so, and and the, the swap space is backed by different storages in, in different machines. Um, but maybe the, the most important point here is backward compatibility. Because adding stuff to the pod API is both a hard thing to do in terms of gaining consensus to do it. But after you add fields to the pod API, you can't remove them. I mean, you, by, by, you can remove them easily, and by saying that, I mean you can't remove them ever, basically. So for example, spec node name, a notorious example for a horrible field 
that everybody agrees is super bad, but nobody wants to remove it just for backward compatibility reasons. So we have to be very, very careful by it, about it. So my idea around it was that we would have no APIs whatsoever. Um, and more generally, what I said is that um, we should frame this cap as basic swap enablement. This way we could actually um, you know, try to GA in the near future um, because there are a lot, of, a lot of stuff that could be extended with swap. And, and there are a lot of different angles that we can, um, uh, that we can extend. Um, but let's not do it now, right? Let's have some swap enablement and then let ha let's have follow-up caps that would treat that would address um, different problems around swap, it would extend it. So one of the follow-up caps will be, uh, sorry, customizability and APIs. Um, but in this cap, I wanted to not present any APIs at all. Um, so it basically means that the limits should be auto-calculated. But how can we do that? So in the alpha days, there, was, there were two swap behaviors, they're called. Um, one of them was unlimited swap. Basically, every container can use how much swap they want. Um, and as we said, that's dangerous because an abuse could lead to node level stability. This um, behavior was uh, eventually dropped and replaced with something that is called no swap. That, that means that nobody can, no pod can swap. Uh, but the limited swap is actually more interesting. And the original idea was to set swap limit the same as memory limit. And again, this, is, this doesn't really make sense. Um, because of a few reasons. So first of all, we give the, 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 the uh, control to the user, right? So basically the user uh, the, or the pod owner is the one who determines um, what are our restrictions around swap. And again, that's too dangerous. Um, another issue here is that um, order of scheduling is matters, right? Because if, let's say that there are two pods with the same memory limit and their memory limit is so high that it's like higher, highest, higher than the, the swap capacity. So basically, there is no limit, right? So the first pod will be scheduled, can use all swap memory. The second pod will be scheduled, and it won't be able to use any swap memory. And that's really bad. We want that, you know, the order of the, the, the pods being scheduled to a node wouldn't change anything. Um, another thing is that it's not correlated to the node's capacity, which is a point that I'll talk, um, uh, talk about a bit later. So a quick reminder about quality of service. Um, so in Kubernetes, we have three quality of, cl uh, of service classes. So uh, best effort is the first one. Basically, it doesn't provide any information about the resources it's going to use. Um, guaranteed is kind of the opposite. It um, specifies both requests and limits to both CPU and memory and they have to be equal. And burstable is basically everything else. So um, let's examine these classes and see which one, for which one of them it makes sense to, to actually swap. So guaranteed, not really, right? Because the whole concept is that it's guaranteed that the memory would wait for you there and, and will not go away. And these are um, usually high priority pods. So it doesn't really make sense to, to use swap in this, in, in this case. Best effort also, um, it's too dangerous. Um, it's um, Basically, we have no information about it, so it's very hard to understand what the limit should be. And another point is that it's, it's okay to kill them if needed, right? That's, that's the meaning of burst effort. Like, you should run them if you, if you can, and if not, that's fine. And so, burst of all is, is actually the, uh, um, a perfect fit for swapping. Because basically, it means that we have kind of baseline uh, of memory that we can use, but we are aware of the fact that it, sh it would burst once in a while. And that's fine. Um, so, uh, oh, and another point is that most of the workloads anyways are bestable, I think, right? Because, because it just uh, covers like most of the cases. Um, so um, the first decision is that only burstable pods would be able to swap. Now, another question to the crowd. Let's say that we have a node with 10 gigs of memory and we have a pod that requests five gigs of memory and limits itself to 20 gigs of memory. Can the pod be scheduled to the node? You're nodding yes, and you're right this time. <laughs> so um, yeah, uh, what I want to emphasize here is that only requests are relevant for scheduling. Limits doesn't, 
don't do have don't have anything to do with it. And so um, the important insight from that is that possibly the limits, the sum of all the limits of the pods scheduled to a node may be greater than the uh, node's uh, memory. But necessarily, the sum of all the requests is smaller or equals to the node's capacity. And that's very important. And so without further ado, let's talk about the actual um, solution. So on, on the one hand, uh, we're going to, um, we're going to um, take RAM and swap capacity into account. And on the other hand, we're going to take memory request um, into account. Now let's say that our node has 10 gigs of memory and 2 gigs of swap. So if this pod is going to be scheduled to the node, um, the, you have the, the formula at the bottom left, but um, I think it's more interesting to, to understand the idea here. And the idea is that 2 gigs of memory is 20% of the RAM's capacity. So this um, pod will be limited to 20% of the swap capacity. So it's basically correlated between them. That way we can, I mean, we solve all the problems that we talked about before. Um, for your, I mean, um, the, uh, who, who scheduled um, first to the, to the node doesn't matter at all. Um, it's, uh, it, this way you don't, have, you don't need to think about what's the size of swap and you not, don't need to provide any values at all. And it just sort of makes sense. Um, by the way, the limits are here, again, just to emphasize that they don't have anything to do with it. Um, so, um, while this problem was very significant, um, a lot more was done. So, for example, monitoring in alpha looked something like that. Um, I had to uh, start bash in, in, the, in the pod and start uh, printing out um, C group files, contents, and stuff like that. So, basically, there was any monitoring support. Um, now there is monitoring support via the stats summary endpoint, which is basically used by Prometheus and other um, monitoring tools. Um, there's also support for VPAs or vertical pod order scalers with the metric resource uh, endpoint. Um, and that's also pretty cool that, that auto scalers can take it into account. Um, but still, um, like people demanded that, um, I mean, this, this, this is for software, right? It's for VPAs and for monitoring tools. Um, the community demanded that um, users will easily find out uh, which, which nodes have swap and how much swap capacity do they have. We thought about doing something like this with kubectl describe node, um, but people re didn't really like it uh, because it, it seems from this as if you can uh, request it in the pod API. And which is which might be confusing, um, and so eventually we'll probably do something like that, a node condition um, that uh, that will um, specify whether swap is enabled and which swap behavior is is used. Um, this is still work in progress, so don't take it too seriously. Another really big uh, thing was memory back volume. So um, for example, secrets and empty DR volumes that are backed by memory cannot um, swap disk. Um, so um, these are two different cases. With secrets, is a matter of security, right? Um, Kubernetes uh, guarantees that secrets will always be on RAM, will not swap to disk ever. And with empty DR, it's more about performance. So um, pods can use um, empty DRs uh, that are backed by memory to have um, pages that are there a demand uh, and wouldn't be uh, on disk. And so um, this was a really um, hard problem because basically all of the limitations that I talked about um, are implemented with C group. And C group is about processes. Now the volumes are mounted by kubelet and shared with the container. But the thing is that you, the volumes can be populated with data that no process can consume. So for example, let's say that processes start out and just dump data into this empty DR volume uh, and just don't ever consume that data. That data. Um, because again, it's outside of the process's uh, consumption. Nothing limits um, uh, these, these pages from being swapped to disk. Um, and this was uh, a very hard problem. Uh, we started thinking about all, of, all sorts of crazy solutions. So currently, 
um, Kubelet uses TempFS to mount these volumes. Um, we thought about other alternatives like RAMFS, which um, the difference between um, RAMFS and TempFS is that um, the pages there cannot swap, so that works for us. But on the other hand, it's very old, it's unconfigurable entirely. Um, so yeah, that was a problem. Um, another um, alternative was uh, using a thing called RBD, which stands for RAM block device. But again, it was very hard to configure and very different than what Kubelet is doing now. And the thing is that um, in order to change how Kubelet mounts volumes in generally, uh, this is a pretty big change on its own. It would demand a different cap that would again need to um, uh, graduate to alpha and beta and GA and it would block us uh, seriously. And uh, yeah, this was one of the moments that I was that I said to myself, maybe this was a bad idea. <laughs> um, maybe, um, I, I'm not sure how we can even solve it, and doing another follow up, another cap that, that would be our dependency is really horrible. But then a kind of a miracle happens, and um, TempFS has these options, right? You can provide options to it, and it turns out that there is a really new option that's called no swap that exactly fits our case. So that was amazing to see. But it had a problem as well, because as I said, it's very, very new. So it's not supported on every node. Um, so basically it's supported um, only on kernels versions that above 6.4, and that's sort of correct, because um, on, you know, upstream on, kernel, on the Linux kernel, uh, that's what's going on. But the distribution can choose to backward it to, uh, to older versions, and that's basically what all of the distribution is doing. Um, so um, what we decided to do, and um, that's a comment from the actual PR and only the last row matters here, is that uh, what we'll do is try to detect if, swap, if um, the no swap option is supported. If it is, we'll use it and everything's fine. If, we, if it, it's not supported, we'll prompt a warning, but we will continue either way. And the thing is that, um, so first of all, how do we know if it's supported or not? So if the kernel version is above uh, 6.4, then we're fine. Uh, if it's not, Kubelet will try to mount a dummy volume and see if it gets an error or like unrecognized option. If that will happen, then, then it's not supported. Um, but the thing to, the key thing to, to understand here about that is that that's a very temporary problem. Eventually, and when I say eventually, I mean the very near future, it will be widely supported within everywhere, basically. So that's, uh, that's how we solved it and got away with it. Um, so this is great. So the current situation. Um, so um, swap was reached alpha in 1.22. Um, uh, we were able to graduate it to beta 1, which is like sort of like half beta in 1.28. It reached full beta in uh, 1.30. And the intention is for it to GA in 1.32. There's all, uh, and, and there is a pretty broad consensus that it will. So. Fingers crossed, but I'm uh, pretty confident about it. Um, and I think I, I'm very happy about it because um, four releases to reach from beta to GA um, with all of these challenges, I think it's lightning speed for Kubernetes, in Kubernetes perspective, so I'm very happy about it. Um, and now there is massive interest about it. So many companies are really interested in it. Intel just gave a KubeCon talk about it. Um, and, you know, Google, NVIDIA, Facebook, tons of companies are, are very um, in favor of this. Um, in, in Kubernetes, Sig notes, it has the highest priority that a cap can have. So, again, it's, it's become from something that nobody cares about to something that it's uh, really important. And um, the follow-up caps are not ready yet, but um, they are a work in progress and they will be introduced soon. Um, so um, I think that this is important because this is the perfect time to get involved. We are just past beta. We are just before GA. This is a great point of time which, that you can share your use cases with us, feedbacks, criticism, whatever, everything that's on your mind. You can message me specifically on Slack or on Kubernetes Signode or our dedicated channel Signode Swap. Um, and yeah, uh, by doing so you can pave the, the way that swap will be implemented, that that's just the perfect time to do so. Um, yeah, so this was everything. I'm the swap out here, and if you have any questions,
That's the time. <laughs> so, yeah, any questions? Yeah, okay, so there is, uh, the question was, um, how can we prevent um, stuff that are outside of kubelet's reach, basically, um, to use swap? And the answer is that you can do that, but kubelet can do that for you. Because kubelet is owning only their um, subtree of the C groups, right? And, and they're basically are, um, uh, are responsible only for the, the, the processes that are created by kubelet. However, um, you can do that on your own, right? So, if, uh, so that's basically, you should look at the best practices that we have on the cab because there are a lot of interesting stuff like that that, that are pretty important. Um, yeah, so I mean, everything that outside of Kubelet's reach, Kubelet can, just cannot do. Um, you can, uh, for example, uh, at the, in the system slice, uh, define um, memory swap max to be zero. Um, uh, but there are, uh, there are more uh, interesting stuff that you can do. So, for example, I.O. latency is an interesting one. Um, because um, when a lot of uh, processes are swapping, it could affect the I.O. Uh, latency of critical processes. So, um, one of the best practices is actually giving priority for the system uh, slice for um, I.O. latency. So, yeah, you can find more information in the, in the cap itself. Uh, Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day.